good. We're good, I think. Okay, calling everybody back into the room. Calling everyone back into the room. Places? Places. We need getting ready for action, right? So um, I want to do a little bit of housekeeping. And the housekeeping is, that have you guys seen the picture of the Amcon gun from Black, was it Black Tie? Black Tie Guns that Yehuda Reamer worked with Black Tie Guns to donate to someone? Well, the rule had been, we were talking about it, making it to where you had to be in the room when we did the drawing. And then we've been moving around when we're doing the drawing. So, so we've kind of modified the rules slightly to where by noon tomorrow is when we'll draw. And you'll have had to have been here and checked in and seen Susan's smiling face and she has an X by your name. And that will then put you in the drawing. There is also a pen, uh, a pen that is uh, We the People, or what, what's the theme? To Pardon? No, Second Amendment. So Second Amendment bullet pen that is back there, and, um, and a box of, but is it ARX? Yes. ARX ammo. Have you not played with ARX ammo? You, you want to win that. Because it, it's really, if, if your gun is really finicky on feed, it loves that. So it is self-defense ammo that does not have the big crater in the front, yet does all the self-defense stuff. The gun is provided by Black Tie Guns. Patrick Woo! Collins brought Woo! the pen and the ammo. So Patrick yeah. Collins <laughs> flew with ammo with your name on it. Just saying, just in case you needed to know that. So we're going to get started as soon as the selfie with Cheryl, Ashley, and Marley is over over here in the corner. I, I'm just saying that you need to you need to check out Cheryl's Facebook page because Marley is the absolute cutest. So, not not to say anything diminishing about you two ladies, but Marley wins the, the selfie. Okay, so let me introduce. Are we ready to go, Paul? Okay, here we go. Let me introduce Ashley Lubinsky. She is one of the foremost authorities in firearms history. Uh, I, if any of you guys know my radio partner, Rob, who is like a gun geek to the nth degree, he's like, Ashley's here, Ashley's here. She is his superhero. That, that's, how, that's how that works. Um, so she is the foremost authority in history, technology, and culture in the United States. Over the past decade, Lubinsky has completely renovated one of the largest firearms museums in the country. And if you've not been there, get thee to it. <laughs> right? I, it's, it's, it's amazing. And um, she currently comp consults with four museums, that one and others, serves as expert witness, and is publi a published author and television personality and the extreme answerer of gun questions. <laughs> So let me introduce you to Ashley Lubinsky and Marley. No, no microphone for Marley. This is his first time at a, at a in-person lecture, so we'll see how this goes. Uh, there have been a couple of lectures that I've given where he sleeps at my feet and then he hears something outside and it, well let's just say it's really good that people don't always know he's a service dog. <laughs> oh, no worries. Yeah, actually, let me put my phone up so I don't talk too much. But uh, thank you guys so much for having me. And I was actually texting with Cheryl during Dan's talk because uh, it's actually funny. Uh, we did not confer before this, but I'm going to talk about a lot of the same things, but just from a different perspective. And I think it, it actually probably answers some of the questions of what we can do to combat that. Um, and so today I'm speaking, oh, I don't know what PowerPoint. Uh, today I'm speaking on the language we use to describe guns, how to research that language, and why the semantics of it matters. 
So I told a PBS News reporter a couple of years ago when they came to the Cody Firearms Museum to see the renovation, uh, I was talking to him and he asked if I get frustrated when people like him get gun terminology wrong. And I told him first off, like I was just happy he was there <laughs> and asking the question. So for that and that willingness to learn, I really, you know, I always support that. Um, and I live in a kind of in-between world with the gun world and the, and the I hate saying mainstream media, um, so the non-gun media. And so I have really positive experiences typically with them. And so I was really happy that he said that. But then I also uh, mentioned that the reason this matters and the reason people get frustrated is because when it comes to crafting legislation, precision in wording is absolutely essential to achieve what you want no matter where you sit on the issue. And the rhetoric used today in the gun debate often serves rather, as Dan pointed out, to evoke emotion rather than clearly describe the actual technology and as a result, confuses much of the discussion that we have and could have on the efficacy of those proposed policies. And there are a lot of terms that are used to describe firearms in this modern gun debate. And some are based on proposed legislation or are used as rhetoric and marketing tools or talking points, while others have real historical definitions yet are used in the wrong context. And the problem here is that these names are often used interchangeably with unlike terms, making this discussion even more confusing. And for example, uh, assault weapons. That's what I said. We, <laughs> we cover a lot of the same ground. Uh, typically, the term assault weapon and assault rifle are used interchangeably. And now, a very, very broad uh, brush definition for some of these things. You know, assault weapon typically relates to legislation of semi-automatic firearms that are center fire with specific features. Although, I will say, assault weapon does have a historic meaning that's separate from the political one today, but I'm not going to get into that one. Uh, and then the term assault rifle, however, arose to differentiate the technology with battle rifles because assault rifles accept an intermediate cartridge and battle rifles a full cartridge. Additionally, an assault rifle is selective fire, and uh, I don't think I need to explain what that is. And one thing I always like to point out, especially when I'm talking to people that don't know about firearms and, and people that do, is an assault rifle, with the exception of ones made before 1986, are not available to the civilians in the United States because of the Hughes Amendment, which is a machine gun ban, and that was part of the Firearms Owners and Protection Act, and is my favorite acronym on the planet, HOPA. And uh, an assault weapon, albeit the most ambiguous term on the planet, is available in most states, and also the actual technology itself, the semi-automatic centerfire, is always available, even in the states with these so-called bans. And so when you hear people say assault rifles after a crime, they're usually referencing semi-automatic versions or really just whatever that means to them. And so the recent attempts to correct misused terminology are often dismissed as unnecessary semantics. I'm sure you guys have been told that uh, by a lot of people. And the lack of precision in the definitions and the technical understandings has really resulted in a lot of the fallout we see today. So I want to point out that I very purposefully talked about assault weapons and assault rifles uh, at the beginning of my speech because I'm not just speaking about non-gun media today. I'm also speaking to those of you in the room whose butts may have puckered because I said the words assault rifle. <laughs> And so I'm going to give a couple of examples. Uh, so like I said, I sometimes feel tangential to the gun world. And so I'm not aware of all these hot button issues and terms that really drive us crazy, OK? So I did a video for Recoil. I used to do an Ashley update. It's like a weekly video. And I thought I was really funny. I was going <laughs> to the internet disagreed with me. Uh, so I set up, uh, it was going to be on the first true assault rifle, OK? So I set up a Sturmgewehr 44, which is you know, usually credited with the first one. And I had another gun in front of it. And I said, today, we're going to talk about the first assault rifle. And I leaned over the Sturmgewehr, and I picked up a Burton light machine rifle. And for gun nerds out there, or Battlefield 1 people, the Burton is a selective fire intermediate cartridge, twin top magazine firearm. It was developed towards the end of World War I. Uh, unfortunately, well, I guess unfortunately, fortunately, the war ended. <laughs> and so there wasn't need to kind of continue on with this. And so I thought that was funny. But then later in the day, I got a text from Dave Merrill at Recoil saying, oh my god. I had no idea that the gun community didn't know that there was a difference between assault weapon and assault rifle. And so it was that idea that they thought it was the same, which really struck me. And then I've also been called an idiot uh, a lot. But for I, I, <laughs> I was uh, doing that PBS NewsHour interview, and we were talking about terminology. And I was standing in front of a display of AR-15s uh, right to my 
other side were M16s, and we used the word assault rifle, and so someone told me, how dare I stand in front of a case of AR-15s talking about you know, assault rifles. And I will point out two things. One, of course, it was a much more edited version, so you didn't hear all the things we were talking about. And two, the AR-15s behind me were in fact selective fire, because before they got the military designation, they were that. So no one cared about that answer. I tried to give it, but nobody cared. So I know all of the arguments. I know that people hate the term uh, assault rifle. And, and I think that you are 100% entitled uh, you know, to the opinions on it. And honestly, you're welcome to use whatever you want. Because I think sometimes descriptors, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, are better than the buzzwords that we hear. But the fact that you don't like it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And so that's one of the things that I think this is an opportunity for our community to because obviously we're confused. And so then other people are confused. So it's really a, a, a teaching tool for people. Um, and so what happens here, and this is across the board, is that when you don't really know about this terminology, you often feel emotion, which is what we talked about, what Dan talked about in the last. And so that can create a false sense of authority, groupthink, and in some cases, and in my experience, mob mentality, and that people who own firearms, they throw around these terms to non-gun and gun owners alike, and it really just becomes off-putting. So I try to sterilize what I'm saying as much as possible. And what this also shows me is that firearms owners and related media need the resources to help them understand so you guys can go forth and be the most informed people in the room. I talk too much, so no one's calling me for CNN, all right? <laughs> they don't have time. Uh, so, <laughs> because if we don't know the terms, how do we expect newcomers or even just information seekers to know? And I always find it really interesting of why we treat people who don't know like shit for shit we don't actually know either. And so the <laughs> other thing that I find helpful, and this is for me and may not have anything to do with your audiences, but I've always found it to be really you know, effective when dealing with, because I deal with a lot of people who are anti-gun and, and a part of the gun control movement in academia. And so I try to recognize there's a difference between ignorance and malice in people's intent with what they're saying. And at least, like I said, in my career, I don't assume what's in people's heads and hearts. Uh, I educate regardless, and it's up to the individual to take what they want from it. I'm not there to make that assumption. I get that called on me all the time. When I testified in front of the Senate, Senator Blumenthal asked me that. That's not my job. My job is to give you the information. Your job is to take what you want from it. So the question here is, how do we do better? Now, I think that the research component should be really, really simple. Um, but unfortunately, there is a lack of peer review scholarship, and the fact that many of us don't agree anyways, like, this doesn't help. And so I created kind of a few steps that I think help you understand the terms that you guys are going to be talking about to your audience. Um, so step one is, oh, hey, your PowerPoint's up. You want to go next? That works. Uh, so step one is acknowledging that you have a problem or that you're confused. It's okay. I'm confused all the time. So no matter how well versed you are with firearms, terminology is complicated. And for example, Amanda mentioned the Cody Firearms Museum. That was one of our biggest difficulties during the renovation, because there are so many terms associated with firearms. And it's almost like you have to speak the language to unlock the secret key to understanding the history of firearms. In fact, I named my uh, consulting business the Gun Code because I find that my job usually is there to decodify these terms for a lot of different audiences. And at Cody, we have about 200,000 people that came to the museum annually. And we did do sur survey work before we did the renovation. And that 100,000 of those people really don't know anything about guns. So we were kind of the first place, and maybe the last place, that are ever going to find that information. So we decided to really focus and spend time on these terms. And throughout the museum, this terminology really did play a role, because we wanted to educate both non-gun owners and then also gun owners, um, because there's always something that you can learn. And so it took us a panel of experts, public educators, my staff, and a lot of other people in editing and going back and forth to create a gallery that looked at all of these basic terms. And you know what was funny? We did like a 101, gun 101 when you first walk in, and it starts, it was kind of building information. It was gun, firearm, I can't remember. It was a long time ago. Um, and what I thought was really interesting was we didn't want to use a word that we hadn't defined yet. So defining gun without using the word firearm and vice versa was really not a fun endeavor. And Danny said it to me, who's now the curator of Cody, yesterday, and I was like, I'm not even reading this because I, we keep changing them all the time. So we're constantly tweaking the definitions when we learn something new. And honestly, one thing I learned, which was really interesting, was uh, in talking to people that don't know about firearms or even hostile to firearms, if I would give them a definition, 
they would have something that like didn't make sense to them that I would never you know have anticipated and I was actually able to have a really good dialogue back and forth on ways that we can communicate this better uh, with people who don't like guns but once you start identifying these terms that you're looking at to me the next step is understanding the historical lineage and knowing that history can strengthen your argument one thing I point out is that history doesn't choose sides and facts are actually debatable I mean people this is the entire field of history is to take the same facts and completely disagree and be very angry about it but many of the policies and laws that are written today are written with faulty rationales that show an overall lack of understanding of not only the history but the way these technologies actually function so step two would be oh it's still there whatever it doesn't matter it's just some lame ass pictures uh, so step two is uh, researching the history so the most practical application to the history that I have now is through lawsuits and typically the justification for these laws and proposed bills center around various principles and the two that I see most often recently are the justification and the terms common use and unusually dangerous. And if that's your rationale you're using, but you don't understand the history of the technologies you're regulating, it becomes really simple to poke holes in these reasonings. That's why a historian can benefit, apparently, on some of these cases. And while that doesn't always stop things from moving forward, as we know, it really does hit hard on the back end. But that's also something that we can all learn because if you don't have the foundation of the argument right, you do run into problems later. So you pick the terms that you guys want to know because there's a lot, um, and then you start researching. And the big topics I encounter a lot are semi-automatics, their features, repeating technologies, and the concept of military guns in civilian hands. And so again, I did not confer with Dan, but I'm going to talk about weapons of war. <laughs> uh, so I want, if you guys want to see, you know, a breakdown of all of this, you can actually go to FBC's website under the Miller v. Becerra, which I think is now Bonta case, the assault weapons ban, and I break down every one of these. Um, so I'm just going to kind of read you guys the history that I provided um, on one of my cases about the term weapons of war, because I think, um, and I think this goes to what you were talking about, Dan, which is there are ways to counter the way that we talk about it, and some of the terms people choose today sound really scary, except for the fact that it actually makes our argument sound better when you know the history. So it's important to note that from an overall historical perspective, early firearms technology was driven by war. However, once that technology was developed, inventors and designers pushed the boundaries of capacity for firearms. And what resulted was the rapidly advancing technology that became too advanced for battlefield use, finding popularity and use rather in the civilian population. Military firearms, in a general sense, were limited by tactics and government bureaucracy, while civilian arms, until recently, were limited by individual budget. Furthermore, civilian arms could be applied in a far greater variety of uses. And while historically, civilians have had the more advanced firearms technology in their possession, not everyone could afford the latest and greatest model. A more affordable option uh, for the user and now a prized option for the collector was post-war weapons surplus, i.e. weapons used in war were sold to civilians uh, both during and after war's end. For example, after the American Civil War, post-war weapons surplus firearms became available on the civilian market. This is actually a whole really interesting history. Uh, but soldiers could buy their own guns for as little as $6, and many dealers and distributors actually sold them in their catalogs for way less. So it was something that was readily available. People modified them. They used them for all kinds of purposes. And so this continues into the 20th century with firearms such as the Springfield 1903 and also semi-automatics like the M1 Garand and the 1911. And that even today, this, through the civilian marksmanship program, civilians can purchase certain military rifles and pistols. So essentially, there's always been an ebb and flow of civilian and military firearms for centuries, and the modern assertion that civilians should not have, as the political phrase states, weapons of war, flies in the face of the entirety of firearms history, where people have generally been able to own and possess the same type of firearms on the bat that are on the battlefield or more advanced technologies on the civilian market. So I always find that one interesting because it is, you know, it popped up and I'm like, well, yeah, I mean, like, we got better guns than weapons of war. It's just history. Um, so you can look at just one thing like that and just knowing kind of, you know, the background of it, you know, that obviously shows that that argument can be totally spun, spun around on someone to go horribly wrong for them. Um, and then, please no, it's my next part of this. This is 2B, okay? So once you're doing your research, I mentioned that, you know, kind of inflated sense of authority. Um, so I want to caution you that there are a lot of examples out there that help justify our cause. And what happens is we turn these into talking points, which we have to, because again, no one's calling me for CNN and Fox News. Uh, so we turn these down into talking points, but what happens is we start parroting each other. So we almost sound like we're in a cult, 
saying the same things when the reality is there's information to go around. So uh, do you guys know what these are? Yeah. Belt and fusel. So yeah. So these ones, I think actually Dana Lash was, I said it at a town hall and I was like, that's random. Uh, <laughs> uh, so these two are used all the time to talk about this. And this is kind of that when it's distilled and bottled into talking points, some of the intent is missing and some of what sticks is weird. So these are the two examples and why I think they're weird is they're obscure. One was arguably never made and the other one was made in small numbers. And so to me, there are way better examples out there that help your case. If you're not familiar though, the belt and fusel, well, that's a terrible picture, uh, operated like a Roman candle with superimposed loads that fired in succession with a single trigger pull. Uh, so these were important in the Founding Fathers conversation. I don't know why I air quoted Founding Fathers. Uh, and so in 1776, 100 of these guns were actually commissioned. But there's a lot of arguments as to why they ultimately didn't make them. And so there is a claim that it was made for civilians. But to be honest, all, I think all the surviving examples have been called into question as fraudulent, even the Smithsonian's patent uh, prototype. So they, it was real. There is a patent, that kind of thing. And then. Often, early firearms such as the Puckle gun from around 1718 and other rapid firing guns, and I point out that the Puckle gun fired six rounds a minute, so woo, calm down, um, are considered the foundation for the idea of a machine gun. And this is something I did write about in one of the bump stock cases. Uh, so the concept of rapid fire and firing as many rounds as possible has been known for centuries. So that argument, you know, with the whole, they did know about repeating technology, it was in common use and all of that, that's still true. But I think it hurts our case when we try to equate it to a machine gun. Um, it's actually, you know, in an academic sense, it's called presentism, uh, which is taking a modern concept and putting uh, your present views onto the past. And so I be careful of falling into those traps and, and kind of being able to use firearms and terminology kind of as they arise in history, because it does trip you up later. And I think a great example of definitions coming to bite you in the ass is the ATF. And their definition, change, definition changes, you know, if they had their way, we would still have shoelaces regulated as machine guns. So be really careful when you start throwing those words around. Uh, so like I said, it's unrealistic for you to know everything, and I recognize that you have to make history digestible. But I really do urge you to be cautious when choosing those examples. What happens is one person says it, everybody says it, and then that leads people on the other side to think that these technologies are anomalies rather than the normal civilian arm. And so with more diversified examples out there uh, by multiple voices, the more it shows that common use, which is so important in the legal arguments today. And then the last step is context is key. So I'm probably going to piss you guys off with this one again, too. I just, apparently I'm making friends. Uh, so once you have your talking points, once you research the history, you, you really do need to look at the broader scope of what you want to discuss in order to understand the context behind some of these terms, technologies, and their respective histories. Context can help you see flawed logic of technological transition in histories. Like recently, the ATF uh, claimed that they needed to change the definition of firearm because technology changed since they made their definitions, except for the fact that one of the technologies they said that changed that they needed to use as a justification was striker fire guns. And these definitions came after the Gun Control Act of 1968, which also imposed restrictions on import of striker fire guns. So they were, in fact, there, and the government, in fact, knew they were there. So when you know that context of you know, the history of these things, you can start to say, OK, mm, something doesn't make sense here. And you're, again, your rationale is faulty. And that's kind of where I always work is like, I don't care where you sit. I mean, I do. But professionally, I don't care where you sit um, on the aisle. But if your rationale is faulty, then what's the, what's the freaking point? Because you're just going to let everybody else down. Um, and so one of the things that I, I actually, I can't remember exactly how Dan said it, but uh, with the terminology, is that marketing here plays a really big tool. Oh, ghost guns. Uh, when I testified in the Senate, it was all about ghost guns. Um, and I talked a long time about this. But my favorite example of context in the role of marketing is the good old silencer versus suppressor debate. Um, and so the reality for me, and I, I say this all the time just because I like to get a rise out of people, it's a silencer. And why is it a silencer? And that's because Hiram Percy Maxim, who invented it, named it that, he patented it that, and he marketed it as that. And that's why that's the wording you see in the National Firearms Act of 1934. That's also why people are really confused. Um, and, but I think we're probably branding experts out there. You know that's like pretty smart. If, you, if you're the first to make it, you, know, you want to call it something that people are going to be like, wow, this is great evolving technology. But marketing is meant to sell products, not describe them. And so the fact that the originals were named silencers doesn't take away or diminish when someone describes it by its function rather than its invention. So a suppressor um, or you know, fire or 
car silencer, which is how he marketed it, but car muffler. Um, but ultimately, I think getting mad at people, for this is the infighting thing that drives me nuts, uh, we're using the term silencer instead of suppressor. Um, it basically, like, there's no point in denigrating one another. Uh, and so I think you should turn that energy outward and use it as an educational opportunity, because if you guys are gonna fight this back and forth, the reality is, is you're both right and wrong in some context. So context again, it matters. So I've talked a lot about, you know, get the terms that you want, research the terms, don't become a cult, and then also how do you find context uh, within what you're trying to study. And so I didn't talk about where you can find this information, and I wish this was simple. And the reason it, that I don't find this to be simple is traditionally scholars take uh, peer-reviewed articles. That's what is considered you know, the you know, top, top tier research. Well, in academia, you don't have that type of uh, study. They discourage it actively. Uh, in graduate school to study firearms. So if you don't have peers, how can you have successful peer review? Uh, a great example is, uh, I'm gonna butcher his last name, but I don't care. Uh, his name's Michael Belial or Belisail, and he's got the infamous book, Arming America. Uh, it's this history book about how guns weren't that prominent during the uh, colonial period and it won a Bancroft, which is like the top award you can get. Uh, I actually know one of the advisors that was on his dissertation board that reviewed this. And then as uh, you probably, if you, the NRA did a, made a whole thing of this. And so he actually was the first person to ever get the Bancroft rescinded because he lied. He made up his, you know, he made up his sources or he may not have, but they like just were destroyed in a flood or something. Um, and so, you know, it's not that the people on the panel didn't, you know, aren't smart people. They just didn't have, they didn't know. And so when you look at the academic works that come out with firearms, they're not done by people who specialize in firearms. They are done by public health people, political people. And so usually the gun information is really wrong. And so to me, and I argue this when I'm in academic forums, if your basic information is wrong, would your conclusions change if you knew it differently? Um, and then on the other side of that, most of our research comes out of gun collecting and gun collectors historically, and now there's the whole online community who's actually doing way better research than like anyone uh, to some extent. And so you've got those people, and those people can have really, really good information, but without a vetting system, how do we know? Um, and a lot of those old gun books, you know, they didn't really cite their sources, um, and so it's really hard for us to, to be able to track that. And, and when we were writing the museum, I was very sad a lot because a lot of the things that we thought to be true was in fact FUD lore um, because when we went back and actually looked at the primary source material, it's you know, totally not right. Um, so where can you start if it's this complicated? <laughs> and welcome to my world. Um, I would say start with, uh, oh, you can't read it. Um, but to start with places that you know are reputable. So museums can be hit or miss because a lot of times people who work in gun collections in museums don't actually know about guns. It's the same issue with academia. But, you know that people who run a gun museum probably know something, or we know the person that knows something. So NRA museums, great. Phil Schreier is awesome. Uh, Cody Firearms Museum, Danny's there. Um, and so, and then also the Royal Armory in Leeds. They get back to you, and they're amazing. Um, so the, look for the museums that specialize in guns, and you can reach out to them. And a lot of times, like I'm a macro historian, so I know, I always say I know a little bit about a lot. Um, so I may not be able to answer the very specific question, but I can probably point you to that person. And so starting with these people that you trust and that you can really know that they, they have your best interest at heart, they can usually get you to who you want. Um, and then, I can't even see what my advice was now. Uh, the other thing is there's a really great, um, there's a really great research, like almost think tank called Armament Research Services, and they work internationally. Uh, it's ARES, A-R-E-S. And so they do a lot of scholarship that's really in depth um, and they partnered with Cody to do a journal now, so you can subscribe to a journal called Armax. Uh, I know the name's terrible, but, uh, but it's now providing really, really in-depth actual academic peer-reviewed scholarship in there as well. Uh, and the neat thing about Aries is Nick Denson Jones, actually, I think it was his PhD, uh, maybe I was wrong, he came up with a new set of super comprehensive definitions of gun terms. Um, and so he'll be releasing that, and I think that'll be really helpful for everyone, because um, he spent you know, years and years and years kind of dissecting this. Uh, yeah, it's uh, ARES, A-R-E-S, and that's Armament Research Services. Um, and then the guy's Nick Jensen Jones. He's probably like, Ashley, shh, don't say my name. Everyone's gonna call me. Um, and so he's putting this together, and so it'll be a really uh, top-notch academic look at definitions. Um, and, and guess what, he doesn't like the term assault rifle either, so 
uh, he, <laughs> he talked about that in there. And so those are great places. Um, in terms of YouTube channels, like I said, there are people with really good content out there. I don't know all of those people, um, but I do know personally Ian McCollum, Forgotten Weapons, is really good. CN Arsenal has done some really good myth-busting work, especially on World War I and trench shotguns. Um, and then also there's uh, the Armorer's Bench, uh, histor historical firearms, almost like made it feminist there, historical. Um, historical uh, firearms is also Armorer's Bench, the same person, and he is an actual academic scholar out of England. Um, that's a weird aside, is if you really want to get good scholars on guns and technical uh, information on guns, you actually need to go outside the US a lot of the time, because in the, in the UK, uh, over in Europe, it's not as stigmatized to study guns in graduate school. So you ironically get a lot better scholarship overseas because it's not as stigmatized, uh, because it's not a part of the cultural debate so much anymore, because they don't really have them. Um, and so if you're looking, overseas is a good place uh, where you can find a lot of that information. Um, and so you gave me five minutes and I was actually wrapping up, so I'm very proud of myself on, <laughs> on that. And so just kind of back to that, uh, we talked about all the different ways that you can do this. I'm happy to point you in the direction of anyone uh, if you need the information, uh, because for me, it's just we need to understand the nuance of our arguments, because if we don't know the nuance, then it's easy for the other side to poke holes in the argument. I sit and I listen and I scream at the television constantly when I hear back and forth because I, you know, I have all of this floating around in my brain and I'm like, oh, you should have said this, oh, you should have said that. And so having kind of spending extra time on that research and understanding the breadth of it, even that's not what comes out of your mouth for a little bit, having that back there, then you can come back with a lot more knowledge. It's almost like good to say only a little and then like when they try to lure you in, you can go bam with all, <laughs> all more uh, information. And so. I think that this is just a really good way for us to kind of start stripping down the emotion side of these terms and disproving the fact that these terms don't even make sense in a lot of cases. And I really, too, the other thing is just like, we need to stop the infighting. So we recognize these terms don't always make sense. So let's not fight our own semantic battle because that's what people say about us anyways. And so let's not prove them right. All right, thank you guys. It was good. So um, anybody have any questions for her? I do, because you're talking about these experts, and I don't know how accessible they are or are not, but they have these databases that we can go to their websites and that sort of thing. But um, I had the, the huge privilege of being able to come to something you've organized, which is the um, it's called the Museum Symposium, but it has a better name than that, I believe. Arsenals of History. Arsenals of History. And be around all of these amazing curators. And uh, is that still happening? And if it is, is it ever something that's going to be, you know, we can watch it on Facebook Live or? Yeah, it is still happening. Uh, we did one last year um, during COVID that actually got great reach because it was online. Uh, and so it will be happening in person. I just don't know when. So I don't know if there's like a email list here where you guys send stuff out, but I can certainly get you that information. And it, in terms of, I'm glad you mentioned accessibility. A lot of times these people are really interested in talking about it, but when you look at institutions like museums, we're understaffed and underpaid. So I do say, you know, if you're going to go to them, they're more than happy to help you. Just don't be rude about it, because we get people who will hound us and hound us and hound us. Um, but these people are accessible, and they're just waiting to be asked, because nobody asks. There we go. Nobody asks. So you have this opportunity. Rob, you got a question? In a museum, you take people in who have limited knowledge, you expose them, well, you deluge them, they only absorb a fraction of it. Have you done before and after studies? Yep. Okay, yeah, tell me have. about that. Um, yeah, and, and luckily they were positive, so that's good. Uh, <laughs> So an interesting survey we did before we started the renovation was we actually uh, interviewed people. So the Firearms Museum is a part of a larger complex. There's five museums total under one roof. And so we only interviewed, we hired somebody who's better at this, but they only interviewed people who were in the center and wasn't, they weren't going to the Firearms Museum. And we asked why. And we found that only 3% of those people uh, would not go in for ethical, moral, whatever reason. 
So we thought that number was really low. The three percent is the are the hard stop, you know. And so we didn't we did not obviously waste our breath on those three percent because we're not going to get them. Um, and so we did do studies beforehand, and, and for the most part, we had you know 25 years worth of knowledge that that was a you know basically a gun sanctuary uh, for people who knew about guns. There was no text really. There were big long text panels, but nobody was reading it. And so it was both in fight the traffic and the conversations that happened afterwards, and also through surveys of what is this museum about. Uh, it was very limited, and it was mostly you only got information from gun people. And then afterwards, uh, actually, I think the greatest uh, compliment we got was uh, the uh, Wall Street Journal came to do a review of the museum, and the guy had actually reviewed another museum in the center, not favorably, and also took a jab at us, <laughs> um, our old museum. So I was really, really nervous. And so he came in, and the museum was already open. And the first thing he said was, oh my god, there's people in here, and they're talking. Uh, <laughs> and he loved, like, I mean, he loved the museum, because when he was in there before, years prior, you know, everyone was just kind of standing there, like looking at stuff, but nobody was having a discussion. And so what we found in the survey work, and I can actually, I have the stats on it. I just have to pull it. I mean, we've had an increase in, fe in women, uh, an increase in non-aficionados, you know, non um, basically an increase in every demographic you possibly want to come into the museum. We saw an increase um, over the year after we opened, and we asked questions about, like, what did you know, open into things, like, what did you learn in the museum, what were the themes of the museum, and people were able to, even though there was a ton of information, people were able to call out most of the themes that we had intended, which was cool. Okay, well, there we go. We're wrapping up now because we've got to stay on track. So everybody, Ashley Lubinsky. She did. Marley was pretty, pretty. <laughs> so those of you who are watching on uh, YouTube, you don't get to see Marley because he's down below the uh, the camera. But just take her word for it; he's adorable. Okay, um, we are going to switch gears to have a VMix guest on. And um, our guest is John Crump. John Crump is a firearms investigative journalist from Ameland News. He, um, federal plaintiffs have used his research in their firearms cases. News media around the country wildly, wildly, widely cites his research into New Jersey gun ownerships not turning in magazines were holding, holding more than 10 rounds as a failure of gun control. John is a Second Amendment advocate, and he serves as the Virginia State Director for GOA, Gun Owners of America. So everyone, John Crump. Thank you, guys. Thank you. All right, actually, let me mute, because right now I'm getting feedback. All right, uh, my name is John Crump, of course. Hold on, let me see. Still getting feedback. Let me just uh, do this. I'll just take this off right now. Yeah, my name is John Crump. I am a firearms journalist for MLN News. I do a lot of investigations and stuff like that. I'm going to walk you through what a FOIA request is, how to do a FOIA request, and answer some questions. One thing about FOIA requests that a lot of people think is it's some long and hard process that is not easily done, but it's not straightforward, but it's also not very difficult. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. I made kind of a little PowerPoint. I know everyone hates PowerPoints, but I think it's the best way to do this. So let me go ahead. I'm going to share my screen right now. Just give me one second here. All right. You should be able to see my screen right now. I'm going to bring it up. That is me right there, and yeah, I'm a engineer. I've also worked in the Intel world for different government agencies, State Department, NSA, uh, DHS, and a bunch of other places. That's where I learned a lot of my investigation skills at. I used to own a gun store. I'm an activist, best-selling author, YouTuber, podcaster, and investigative journalist. I also have ADHD, if you can't tell. All right, let's get into what a FOIA request is. A FOIA request is a law that was passed in, a FOIA was a law passed in 
1967 stands for Freedom of Information Act. It basically requires that the government give information over to the general public that they want that has to deal with government things that is not of national security concern. It's a powerful tool. It's not only used by journalists, but it's also used by a lot of activists and the watchdogs and also the general public, which I think a lot more of the general public really should be doing FOIAs on themselves and other things. With the FOIA, you can do several different things. You can discover evidence of a runaway bureaucracy and evidence of government overreach. And that's one of the things I find out with my FOIA request into the ATF when they're doing some overreach. For example, if you guys know about the rare breed trigger situation with the FRT trigger, through a FOIA request, I was able to uncover that the ATF basically determined that the FRT trigger is a machine gun before they even tested it. They came to that conclusion before they got it. And that's now being used in the lawsuit down in Florida because of that. Uh, you cover evidence of corruption, and I've done that from turning up emails from people to different people. And it's like sunlight is the best disinfectant. So the more people doing these FOIAs, the less overreach that there is going to be. There are some limitations to doing a FOIA request. Some of the information that you might request might be classified to protect national security. It could be um, blocked because of personal information such as HIPAA information, social security numbers, stuff like that. Some have to deal with trade secrets. If you try to FOIA something that a company is trying to produce that's unknown, a lot of times you can get that information, but if, if it works a different way than anything else on the market, they might say you can't have that for trade reasons. Or if there's bank banking information in there, it, Whatnot, and you cannot FOIA things between like law lawyers and people. Like if an agency has an attorney working for them, you can't FOIA the information for the communications between that attorney and like the uh, head of the ATF or whatnot, because they have attorney-client privileges. There are several other limitations to it. Um, as we said, the information that would disclose uh, personal privacy, so security numbers, stuff like that. There's also law enforcement exceptions. And right here, here's four of them, but there's others too. But you will see a lot of times something redacted in a form that will say 7B, 7C, 7D, 7F. Those are all law enforcement exceptions. If there's an open investigation, they can block out that information. One interesting thing is if you FOIA yourself and they come back with no documents found, then you're okay. If they come back with, we cannot disclose this information because of one of these exceptions, then you might have a little problem on your hands. Also, uh, banking information, of course. There is a step, uh, there, there are a series of steps I like to take when I do a FOIA. First, I will determine what information I want to learn. Let's say I want to learn about David Chipman's communications, why he was at the ATF. Um, the first thing I would do for that is go to the ATF reading room, also known as the resource center. And I have all these links. If you go to crumpy.com slash FOIA, you can have all my links there. But you can search to make sure someone already didn't search it. Because what will happen is if a lot of people file FOIA requests, and then they forget about it, and they get the FOIAs, but the ATF also puts it in their FOIA library. For other government agencies, they use FOIA.gov, and they have a search feature, so you can search that. 
So I always search to make sure the information is not out there. I found some really big stories by searching through the FOIA libraries. Then I was location most likely lit. So I will say an ATF special agent. So ATF there, and then I will determine that he was in the criminal branch. So I would tar target the ATF in the ATF's criminal branch. The more information you can give them, the more information that you will probably get back. Then I will narrow down the topic. So I'll say I want David Chipman Communications to shot spotter and then from there i will go down to a time frame and i'll say between april 2008 and june of 2009 you always want to give them a time frame and you want to be as narrow as possible what you're trying to determine and is where that information most likely will live and also if you make it too broad they will just deny it then i'll determine how much i am willing to pay most of the time they won't make you pay anything because you can claim a media exception but you always want to put down at least a hundred dollars the first hundred pages are free but if you put down i'm willing to spend zero dollars they're not going to take you seriously so you always want to put down at least $100. And then you want to let them know why. Why do I want this? In my case, it's always going to be because I'm a journalist working on a story. And then I'll write out the request. A little bit later on, I'm going to do a request or write out a request, and I'll show you exactly how to do it. All right. Like I said, you always want to list at least $100 or so they're not going to take you seriously. In the FOIA, you want to put down the name of the agency. The FOIA officer, I have a good relationship with a lot of FOIA officers at the ATF, so I would address it directly to a FOIA officer. But if you don't know who the FOIA officers are, you always address it to the head of the agency. So ATF would be like Marvin Richardson in what documents you are requesting and be as specific as possible the time frame and who you are you can file most FOIA requests at FOIA.gov the ATF they have their own FOIA because they're the ATF and that's what they do and that's FOIA mail at ATF.gov once again everything is on crumpy.com slash FOIA and you can get all the sources. What happens after you, you get a FOIA request filed? You'll get an email response and probably won't be right away, but you will get an email response with a tracking number and a FOIA officer assigned. So you want to keep track of that because that is how you're going to track your FOIA. And when they finally respond to your FOIA or they ask you any questions about the FOIA, they're not going to give you what the FOIA is about. They're going to be like, we have a question about this FOIA. Here's the tracking number. And if you don't keep track of it, you're going to be like, what the hell tracking number? You're going to run them back asking like, well, what's the subject of the FOIA? And they're going to say, we can't tell you that. So you always want to keep that tracking number. They're not going to make it easy on you. The results, you're going to get no documents found, which happens a lot. Uh, they're going to say it's too broad because it's not narrow enough, and then you're going to have to narrow it down and refile. They're going to claim an exception, criminal investigation, etc. Once again, if you FOIA yourself and you come back and they give you a, an exception for a criminal investigation, you know you're in trouble. <laughs> at least they're looking at you. You always want no documents found. Right now, I'll tell you right now, when I file a FOIA myself, I get an exception, but that's because I file so many FOIAs. I know what they have on me. And another thing that could happen, you will get the document released. And what they would do is give you a link to a Dropbox-like website 
but it's a government website. And you can also get a no response. A no response happens a lot. If you go to foiaonline.gov, FOIA Online, Action, Public, Home, you can take that FOIA number they gave you, stick in there, and you can see where the FOIA is. Before you can file an appeal, at least 20 days have to pass. And right now I'm telling you, you're not gonna get any FOIAs back before that 20 days. Usually they're one to two months. When you do get a FOIA back, you'll get, uh, you'll get exception codes re for redactions. And what you gotta do is you gotta look at those exception codes and see if it's valid. If the exception code is not valid, you have to decide whether it's worth appealing or not. Right now, I'm gonna stop this and I am going to show you what I'm talking about by exception code. So let me just pull this over here. Right here, this is a FOIA I pulled on all imports coming into the country. B6 exception is for personal information and this is from CZ and above CZ USA would be a person's name. So that's why that, that there's an exception there. Serial number is also a B6 exception. So I know those are valid. Now, if I saw the B6 exception somewhere like under company name, then I know that's not valid because that's public information. Or if I see it down here under approximate uh, length, that would not be valid as well. Or if they, like uh, the, the made N, if there's an exception there, that wouldn't be valid. So I know those, those wouldn't be valid, so I could appeal or I could just let it go. So you have to decide how much is it worth to find out what is redacted. If denied, you have several different steps. You can try to convince the FOIA officer to try again, and that actually works more than you would think, as long as you're nice to them. You gotta remember the FOIA officers, they're going out to try to get you the information. They are not really the ones that will try to stonewall you. Their, their job is just to reach out to the appropriate agency and department to get that information that you want. So always be nice to those guys. The nicer you are to them, the more chance that you can convince them. There's the Office, the office of Government Information Services, which you can go to. I haven't had too much good luck with them, but they're supposed to advocate on your behalf. They're supposed to be like an arbiter, but they're not exactly unbiased. And then you can appeal. When you appeal, this is what you can appeal on. If you believe the agency withheld information or redacted information that shouldn't be, and you have compelling evidence, you should appeal. Now, if you don't have any evidence that they actually have the information, then your appeal could be a waste of time. And you want to build up a track record where you win your appeals. The agency denied your your fee waiver. So if you claim that your media and your fee should be waivered because media shouldn't be charged for FOIA requests and they denied it, you can appeal that. Usually that won't be the case. Usually they're pretty open about it. If you just say, hey, I'm media, they're not going to even check. They're just going to give you whatever. Or the agency charged you a higher rate than they should. So let's say they charge you $1,000 for 101 pages. You can say this is excessive and try to get some of your money back. What to include on the appeal, the FOIA number, the data the FOIA submitted, the date of the response, and if any of those three are missing, even though they can easily get it, they will just throw away your appeal. They would deny it because you didn't supply all the information. The stated reason why they denied you originally and why the documents should be given to you or what redaction should be removed. 
So you can say they said this document doesn't exist, but I know it exists because I have an inside source that verified that this document existed. That would be one thing. Or if you say this was redacted, but it obviously is not personal information, so therefore the redaction should be removed. All right, so if you're appealing a fee, FOIA request number, date of the FOIA submitted, the amount charged, and why you should not be charged that amount. If your appeal is denied, then you can do one thing. You can sue, or you can drop it. If you sue, do not attempt to do it without a lawyer. If you do, they will eat, your, they will eat you for lunch. If the agency loses, they must pay all legal costs. If you lose, you can be out thousands of dollars. I will only appeal, I will sue for, for a denied appeal if I know the information exists. I have a lot of inside sources, so I usually FOIA stuff that I know is there. So when we do sue, we say, this is the reason why we should get it. And the reason why we should get it is because I have the documents, here's the documents. And you enter them into the court record, the courts will look at it and be like, all right, yeah, this absolutely does exist. Government loses, my lawyers get paid, and I cause a headache for the ATF. And I verify the documents that I have in the link. Now, if you're following yourself, you need to provide information about who you are. So you have to provide a government issued ID, like a passport is the best. And they should give you all the information unless it's criminal on yourself. If you try to follow someone else, they're not gonna give you anything because you're not that person. But you're entitled to everything that the government has on you. Things to remember. There is a possibility of expediting a FOIA request, and I have used this when they needed to get information real fast because it's a hot story. But the more you expedite, the more you build a reputation of them thinking that you're a pain in the ass, and the less they're going to work with you. So if you expedite every request, they're going to deny most of those expedites without even looking at it. But if you expedite request only when it's really needed, then you have a bigger chance of getting your expedited request actually fulfilled in a timely manner. Be nice but firm with the FOIA officers. Remember, they are your advocate, so you got to be nice to them, but you don't let them off the hook. With the exception of if you want a FOIA really, really quickly, and you have another FOIA that you're just fishing for, you can say, hey, I will drop these three FOIAs if you fill this one FOIA for me right now. Now, a lot of times they're like, oh, that's less work for me. So absolutely. And they will drop it. And make the FOIA as easy as possible to file. So basically be as specific as possible of where these documents are located at. You got to remember the FOIA officers are government employees. So as government employees, they are a little bit lazy. So if you make it easy for them, they will do the work. So if you say, Hey, this document is located, in this department of the ATF, it's located in, I don't know, the NFA branch or Fat D, which is the uh, firearms technology branch. And it's located, this is the name of the file, for example. A lot of times I can give them the name of the file because I already have it. They will go out and get it. But if they have to do a lot of work, they'll look around and just be like, okay, well, you know, I'm going to drop it because like look it around. 
Also, the more FOIA requests that you file, the more they will get to know you. So if you file FOIA requests that actually returns results, instead of just fishing expeditions with a wide, wide net, you're more likely to get answers because you will build a reputation of them knowing that you know that there's documents there. Every agency has their own timelines, and those change all the time, depending on how many FOIA requests they get. I've had some that are several months. I've had some that are one month, but you can't appeal until 20 days pass. You're hardly ever going to get a FOIA request less than 20 days. So I wouldn't worry about appealing until it's about 30, 45, maybe 60 days out. And then I will appeal saying, hey, this is taking too long. But 20 days right now is not really realistic to get a FOIA request back. So even though that you can appeal at 20 days, I would wait a little bit longer. And if you appeal right at 20 days over and over again, you get that reputation of being a pain in the ass with the FOIA officers, and then your request will get filled a lot, um, a lot longer. It would take a lot longer for them to fill your request. I can put in the same request as another journalist I know who was just cashing, uh, casting a big net, and my request will get filled before his because I have a reputation of targeted requests that actually exist where he has been casting a wide net and just trying to pull up anything. I've been working with him and his responses are getting quicker because he's doing more targeted OIAs, which is a good thing. So final thing is you want to make the FOIA request as simple as possible. All right, what I'm going to do now is we're going to fill out a FOIA request. The website that I listed in the PowerPoint, and it's also at crumpy.com slash FOIA, actually has a FOIA request template. So I'm gonna FOIA the ATF here. So let's say I don't know who the FOIA officer is. So the first thing I'm going to do is make it up to Marvin Richardson, who's the acting director of the ATF right now. Going to put the department, uh, the agency name, which is the Bureau of Alcohol, Firearms, Tobacco, and Explosives. You're supposed to spell it out. And the address, which is their Martinsburg address. The reason would be Freedom of Information Act request then dear director richardson and you're going to say that you're filing under the freedom of information act if you don't say that they're going to be like we're not going to give you anything because you didn't tell us why you need it but if you say freedom of information act you're good there then i wrote i request all that copy of the sorry i request that a copy of the following documents be provided to me all communications between David Chipman and Cheryl Todd between March 1st, 2008 and May 5th, 2008, because I got it on good resources that Cheryl Todd has been communicating with David Chipman. And down here, in order to help determine the status of my accesses, you should know that I'm a representative of the News media affiliated with MLA News and requests is made part of my news gathering and not for commercial use. Commercial use is if you're going to use it in an advertisement or if you're going to paste it on the front of the box of the gun you're selling. You can also request a waiver if you're affiliated with a educational or non-commercial scientific institute or if you're doing it for like a research paper or if you're an individual and you're trying to seek it for personal use 
or if you're affiliated with a private corporation that is seeking information for use in the company's businesses business that's not to print it on the box that's not to advertise that if that's if you're doing research like for example the FOIA request i showed you before was of fat d so if you want to do research and what other companies are bringing into the country that is totally legal and that falls under the exception then you want to state how much you're willing to pay and so i'm willing to pay fees for this request to a maximum of $100. If you estimate that the fees will exceed this limit, please inform me first. So if they say we have 2,000 pieces of paper and we're gonna charge you $1,000 for it, they will contact you and try to get your permission before they actually charge you that. And you always want to pit that you request a waiver of all fees for the information because it's in the public interest and it will contribute significantly to public understanding of the operations or activities of the government and is not primarily for my commercial interest. And then what you want to do is sign your name Put your name down there, your address, your city, everything else, and your telephone number if you so choose. And what I would do is I would make an email to the, the ATF and put Freedom of Information Act in the subject line and copy and paste this into the body of the email. And wait. Hopefully you will get information back. And one of the cool things about FOIA request is you can use that information that you get back to request more FOIAs. I try to do at least one FOIA a month, not a month, a day, sorry. If uh, to different organizations, I just turn off my uh, screen sharing here and try to get as much information as possible. Sometimes you get mundane information or nothing too shocking, but a lot of times you'll get information that does move the needle and does show like government overreach. For example, I got uh, FOIA information on the ATF doing, look, doing research into COVID and doing research into COVID fraud. Why is the ATF doing that? I'm not sure, but that shows you mission creep and overreach. So I use that information to write an article about the ATF and how they're trying to overreach. And I think it's for budgetary reasons, but that's how I get most of my information. And right now the firearms industry is not really doing too many FOIA requests, which is a shame because there's a ton of information out there and there's a ton of information on how the ATF works. So you can actually be able to tell how they work and how they look at stuff and how they look at laws by just doing FOIA requests. And with that, I want to open it up to any questions out there. Okay, I'm coming down here with a mic, and I have you have a couple questions. So the first one is Ms. Cheryl Todd from Arizona. Hey, John, how did you know me and Chipman were so tight? ATF leaks. <laughs> I love you. You are awesome. Um, so the question I really have is, if you're FOIAing yourself, what is the why? What, what is the why that you say to them? Yeah, well, when you FOIA in yourself, uh, uh, what, you, what you tell them is that you want to FOIA yourself for your personal information. You don't have to get like, to make sure there's no criminal investigations against me or anything like that. All you have to just say is I'm personally, I'm FOIA myself for my personal information to see what the government has. This was great.
Yeah, I no problem. I had to ask the government to tell me what they know about me, but that may be what I do over, over the weekend, right? When I, in my spare time. Okay, I'm making my way up through the audience. Had her hand up first. So, um, Nikki from California, here you go. John, I'm noticing a pattern of non government agencies operating that and could we use the FOIA to establish uh, with find out? I think uh, it broke up there. You know, we'll say in private actors acting for the government in things that the government shouldn't be doing in the first place. Yeah, what what I have done is is FOIA the ATF with their actions with other non-government actors such as like Moms Man Action, Ceasefire, and and all them. Where I'm seeing that a lot at is on the state level, where you actually don't do a FOIA, you do an open records request, and each state has their own laws. But I was able to FOIA or oh, do an open records request in Virginia with a bunch of different organizations. And I found out that the governor's office has been working with uh, Giffords a lot. At the same time, I did another open record request with New Jersey and found out that they're working with the Brady campaign a lot. And in fact, in Virginia, I was able to find out that Virginia gave Giffords like $4.6 million for their uh, ceasefire initiative so yeah you, you can use it but you can't FOIA the actual non-government agency but you can refoia communications between of government agencies with non-government agencies to try to build a pattern i want to get a question in from that's come in from the internet uh smeggy asks question for you john how do you know what specific thing to request you keep saying asking for something you know exists but how do you know? Okay, yeah, there is a couple different ways. Uh, like one way is I develop sources inside the ATF that tells me that they know it exists. Another thing you can use, uh, open source intelligence. Like you see in the newspaper talking about this group talked to such and such or you actually use the information on the actual website. Like I FOIA stuff because Gifford said they talked to a, a public, uh, like a, like a, what was it? Uh, Giffords talked to, uh, I think it was, it was one of Biden's cabinet members. So I FOIA that information because I got it directly from the Gifford site. So you have to do a little bit of legwork with the actual research by keeping an eye on the anti and also newspapers and everything else. Okay, well, thank you. Um, we've got one more question. This is our last one before we, uh, before we say thank you to you. So Rob Morris from Louisiana. John, I remember, Hi, Rob. Hey, John. I remember reading about government information deliberately being mislabeled so that it was harder to FOIA. Have you run into that? Yes, I, I have. Um, there is a big effort to try to find that information and there's no easy way to find that information without like flipping sources and stuff like that, which I have done. And also if you have like stuff directly inside it instead of foiling the title you actually FOIA from the like so instead of all communications between like david shipman and such and such organization you will FOIA stuff like um dealing with mom's demand action ceasefire initiative whatever they really want to call it and they will search, and it actually searches the body instead of just the titles between that. But that's one of the things that is one of the harder things to deal with. And there's no real easy answer, and there's no perfect answer to that. So I would suggest 
try to develop sources, be nice to people, and do um, targeted searches of the body of the documents instead of just the uh, who, who, and who from to. Okay, well, thank you very much. So, folks, John Crump. All right, thank you, guys. Thanks, John. Thanks for your time. We really, really appreciate it. Uh, no. So, um, we are going to move to a, an in-person presentation from our own Rob Morris. And Rob Morris writes for the Slow Facts blog. He produces Self-Defense Gun Stories podcast and is a regular co-host on the Polite Society podcast. He's also a weekly guest on Lock and Load Radio and writes the Armed Citizen column each week on Amaland. Now, the one thing that you that is not in his bio, but you're going to see is that he's a slow-talking, deep-thinking guy. So when Rob Morris speaks, there's some uh, depth to those conversations. Everybody, Rob Morris. Now, being slow-talking compared to Amanda and Ashley, it's a relative term. Around, you know, when I'm talking to my kids, they go, would you say, Dad, tell me again. By the way, if it's all right with you, I hope I want to cut it a little short. We we'll use Q&A, and then we can go to lunch a little early. <clears throat> We're going to talk about respecting, choosing, developing your audience. We're also going to talk about branding. Um, and you need a brand. I want to convince you of that. If there was a before and after question, do you need a brand when we're done? I hope you'll say yes. Amanda talked about some of the places my material can be found. Each one of those is different. What I put on my blog isn't what I put in my podcast, isn't what I do with all on Polite Society. That's not what I carry on the radio. Each one is a very particular audience that expects information delivered in a particular form. I'm a, I'm a brand, if you will, because I have expectations with my audience. Oh, if I want this sort of material and th treat it this way, I would look here. And Rob would treat it that way. Years ago, and I have to call him brilliant, a brilliant designer I've worked with shared hard-won wisdom with me. He said, and I'm going to quote him, primary purposes are primary, and everything else is secondary. It's another way of saying if you want to be good at everything, you're not very good at anything. So you want to focus your efforts. I've had people who go, I really love this sort of music, and they put it in their podcast, and I'm going, well, is this a music podcast? I understand if you enjoy it. of your We'll talk a little bit more about why is that applied to us? Well, we can direct our podcast to a very narrow and all audiences. Expectations. The expectations you have with your audience are why they listen. I expect this material presented in this way. By downloading your they've placed in order just as if you were in a restaurant. 
And these days, 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 you might have a lot of money. 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 You might have a lot well, how does this fit in our gun culture? When we used to have GRPC, there were people from every possible background. Historically, walking encyclopedias on firearms and how they operate. Or we've got a training screen how the fact that you find it fascinating is you're an expert. And if your audience is an expert, we will be with you. Now, 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 Someone goes, yeah, 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 my podcast is short, it's 14 minutes, and this one is running right now. You have to go, 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 but that's very different than you guess like that. She 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 is your audience expecting to be abused, inspired, or educated? The answer, of course, is yes, all three, but by how much? In the first 13 seconds, I've identified my audience on my podcast. And that includes four seconds of intro media. They get it every time. If someone listens, listen, 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 list
Decisions made it harder for them to defend them. How they have to change their behavior in light of political decisions. But I have to leave that out. Let me give you some of the feedback. A frightened poet, she might meet a guy. Doesn't need any
Not only is he not a material they don't want to have to make that One way to respect your audience is to sound like half of the new gun owners are women. Half of the co hosts tonight are women. Three of them are more. I'm trying to get the Spanish version of my podcast. I used a search engine to find out what new gun owners are looking for. It's my job to get those tags in my podcast. It's not their job to, 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 to find divine inspiration. Right, right, right. I'd like to find out what they're looking for. That doesn't work very well. This podcast. It's it, 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 all about John's John podcast. podcast. And, and there are lots of you who are fascinated. I'm sure I'm not interesting enough to hold an audience. I've been told by podcasts in the top 1% of podcasts. The only way I know. I produce the boring McDonald's hamburger of podcasts. Would you like dry practice with that episode? It's a formula. There every single time. And I try to Interpretation that's required to access the material. My instructors can say something like this. I tried this technique. I'm excited about it. With practice, this really worked. Cool. That's as sophisticated as I want to get. I'm not going to talk about ulnar and radial pressures and, and split times. All that stuff is way beyond. I'm trying to get the person on the margin to go take their second class if they have their concealed. Or the person who thinks they are going to be a gun owner, yeah, go get it. Get a gun that you take uh, to a concealed carry class later. Be brief. I hate did air. I hate it with a passion. I lose my audience. Every time I bore them, when I write, I figure that I lose half my audience every 400 words. I am for 20 minutes, I let myself slide to 22. Five seconds of intro music, not more. A single 30 second commercial, somebody gave me 35, I sped it up and cut it down. Cheryl's done a commercial for me for SAF. I present four news stories and there's a three second gap between them. That's, That's it. it. Ah, suppose uh, Ben's one of my uh, co-hosts. He says something really important, really insightful. The way I underline it isn't with a pause. I said, man, I really have to think about that. Give me a minute. Next topic. I've told the, the listener to take a break, and maybe they'll stop the podcast. They can do that. I don't need to give them a 15-second thought pause there. It's very dramatic in theater. Theater's a different medium than a podcast. So that's how I focus my audience, and that's how I show respect to them. I love to talk about self-defense gun stories. I love to talk about the armed civilians we have today. I love to talk about how the media views them. By the way, if that fits your audience, come find me, please. But that's also why, if you invite me on your podcast, I probably won't reciprocate. Unless you're an expert in those areas, I can't, because I'm trying to respect my audience. 
Thank you for your attention. I'll take Q&A and, and we get to go to lunch early. Okay. So does anybody have questions for Rob? Okay, that works. Yeah, is it out there? Okay, well, there's a couple things I wanna say. If nobody's got any questions for Rob, I'm gonna release him. Oh, there you go, Rob. So, um, but anybody wanna buy an extra cell phone? Because I've got one. <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, the, the thing. There. So, you know, I was taking notes while this morning session went on because I, I like, I like picking up kind of keywords and little sentences and little things to, as Rob put it, to think and to, to kind of stick into my toolbox. Because a couple of years ago, we had EMCon, and Yehuda Reamer said, but did you ask? And that was the takeaway that I carried away from that EMCon that then made me braver each time I was like, you know, I really wish I knew this person, or I really wish I could get that one as a sponsor, or I really wish, and he's like, and he was actually dogging Charlie Cook out when he said it, but he was like, he was like, but did you, no, that's all good, but did you ask? And it was like, you know, I think that that's one of the biggest things about us is that we, we have an idea where we want to go, but we don't ask for help, for a hand up, for a handout to get us where we want to go. So know that each one of the people that are in this room and the people who are watching this and who are participating via vMix and video and wherever, that they are all offering right now to be a resource and to offer whatever their area of expertise is for you, to you, so that as simple as an ask, they will be your resource. So a couple of takeaways that I got out of this before, because I'm, I'm, this is, I'm done, and then I'm handing it off to Cheryl right after lunch. And so there we go. But Dan's video, or Dan's presentation. No, wait, wait, let me, let me start with Craig, then we get to Dan. So Craig's was, if you want to do something, you actually have to start. And that made so much sense because it's like, we'll, we'll do it next week or we'll do it the week after. Or Rob Morris asked me, so how's that book? With, what's the publication date for that book you've written? Um, yeah, the second day of never because I'm 200 pages into it and not done. But it, you have to start and then you have to finish. And good enough is good enough at that point and then you can get better. So that's what I got out of that. Um, let's see, Dan's, I'm gonna use this. There's a shootout in the produce section because, <laughs> right, there's, there's some scary woman that's got a gun somewhere. And people ask you questions and sometimes how do you answer those? And I wanted to tell you this, Dan, that um, people ask me a lot, how many guns do you own? You know, and that's a personal and private question. So my answer is, I'll tell you that right after you tell me, how much money's in your 401k? And they, they're like, well, that's really rude. Exactly. So since you're not answering, I'm not answering, we'll just move on to the next topic. You know, just, just kind of that. Um, let's see, John Crump, crumpy.com. Who would have ever thought to name, <laughs> to name your website crumpy.com? Um, Ashley, the fact that you don't like it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. So so get over it, live with it. FUD lore was one of her facts, of the, of the facts that are not facts are FUD lore. And um, yeah, they are the ATF and that's why they do what they do. And um, FOIA yourself. Who would have ever thought to FOIA request yourself? You're gonna do it? You're like, how can I delete some of those photos? That's all, that's all I want to know. I, I need to, yeah, we're going to ask that question. Okay, well, that is the end of my portion of this presentation, folks. If you've got any questions for me as we go through the whole weekend, please feel free. If there's something that I can do, some way that I can help, um, please 
Um, also, if, before we turn you all off for lunch, I got just a couple things if I can, one real thing if I could. Um, and I'm going to, we're here so I can get on, on camera before. To the light. Yeah, exactly. So people can see you. So, so when the light is glaring in your eye, you're good. Exactly. <laughs> all right. Um, I want to add one thing that I, I kind of meant to say this this morning, but I got a little emotional and it, it, it did totally uh, slip my mind. But uh, the one bit of advice, if you are you get just getting into media, maybe been in it for a little bit, I had a conversation with a friend, and they this has been within the last few months. And as most of you know, I came on as an employee of the Second Amendment Foundation back in October, and I've been doing, I started off, as Rob explained, the Polite Society podcast almost nine years ago. Uh, no, I, yeah, it's been nine years ago, so I've been working on this, and I've been, I, I've had an association with the Second Amendment Foundation through broadcasting GRPC for seven years, and I've worked closely with them, and I have done really good work with them and I've been working on what I've been doing and kicking butt for a long time and then this opportunity came about and my friend said to me the other day he said you know it's it was really fortunate for you to come up for that to come about almost as if I'd never put any work towards anything you were just in the right place at the right time is what he said and, you know, the one thing I'm going to tell you, anybody, whether you're, you've been doing this two days, if you're going to start next week, or if you've been doing it a year or two, don't ever, 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 don't ever quit. Keep going. Good things will happen to you. Keep trying to improve. Keep working at it. Good things will happen. Hey, if they happen to me, they're going to happen to you. So uh, that's, that, that's all I got for this morning. Enjoy your lunch. What time are we back from lunch? Or are we well, um, do we want to do that now or do we want to do that when we come back? I'm, uh, let's leave that when we come back because I'm going to put it on our friend. I'm going to put it on Cheryl. So why don't, we, why don't we do it right now and bring Cheryl up because we can do that. And she, she has Gee, do you think Cheryl will take a mic from me? I, I don't think she's ever, as much as I love Cheryl, I, I, as much as I love Cheryl, I, she's never met a mic that she doesn't like. So here you go. No, I'm going to give her this one. It's you. It's so shy. I don't even know why they would hand me. Can I have both, maybe? <laughs> and I'm the other guy, Dan. Um, so right now, I believe what they're asking me to transition to is... Uh, Giving out our the person who makes a difference award. The person now, this room is filled with people, all kinds of people, who make a difference. Our audience online, you see me online. So many of you out there, citizen journalists, people that are uh, just now thinking about being citizen journalists, are always making a difference. But you know, with the cream. And the milk, right? The cream always rises to the top. And we definitely have somebody in the room here today who is absolutely, without a doubt, made an, an incredible difference, not just in the last year, but it's this year we're, we're honoring this person, um, but throughout the years. And I am so excited that uh, I get to take part in, in presenting this award. Paul? Susan? We're just going to keep <laughs> passing that buck. <laughs> this year we're giving the making a the person who makes a difference award to Chris Chang. Chris Chang. Yes. I'll let, I'll let you present it. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, wow. Uh, very 
uh, surprising, and uh, I'm honored. Um, you know, reflecting back on the past 10 years of, of, of being in the Second Amendment community and, and being an advocate for gun ownership and the responsible usage and, and storage of firearms, it's, you know, I, I, I think back to the early days of being an advocate and being part of outdoor media. I mean, these times where you're just wondering, is anyone listening to what I have to say? And to Paul's suggestion of just, you got to keep going. you got to keep going even when you don't think that anyone's listening to you. But, you know, winning this award affirms that people are listening to my message. And it's not necessarily that everyone agrees with me. Uh, you know, there are definitely plenty of people who agree with me, but plenty of people who don't. And that's, I think, a part of our reality, being gun advocates, being advocates for freedom and for liberty is that we have to keep we have to keep on telling our stories, telling each other's stories, inspiring each other to continue the good fight because we are fighting for what we believe is right. We believe in freedom. We believe in this radical concept of private firearms ownership. It is it is an ideal and an idea that is incredibly unique to the United States of America. And I will keep on you know, speaking that truth, our truth, our message. I've done it for 10 years. I'm you know, intending to do it for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years more. And so thank you to, uh, to AMCON, to everyone here. I'm truly honored. Thanks again, and uh, I guess it's, it's time for lunch. <laughs> it, it is time for lunch, but this is one of the ways that Chris Chang made a huge difference this year. It was a conversation starter. Uh, we're going to be talking about this and other things a little bit after lunch at the Beyond the, the Choir panel with Ashley Lebensky and Chris and I. And uh, I'm going to put him on the spot and ask him to autograph my copy. So there you go. Thank you guys so much. Please um, break for lunch. At what time are we coming back? 1 o'clock? 1 o'clock? All right, food is right outside the door. There's plenty because a lot of our people that were supposed to be here for lunch, I think, went to USCCA, so we get extra lunch. Okay, and for the people viewing... Uh, online. We're going to go ahead and shut the stream down. I'll bring it back up shortly before 1 p.m. Central Time, the only time zone that matters. We will see you all in just under an hour. <laughs>